Hello everyone, hope all of you are doing good and today's topic of discussion is a recent talk released in 2022 and the topic is management of hemoglobinopathies in pregnancies and childbirth. So the two common hemoglobinopathies that we will be discussing will be sickle cell anemia and beta thalassemia. Both of these demonstrate autosomal recessive inheritance pattern. Sickle cell anemia it is the commonest inherited condition. HBS genotype variant, it is caused by a single amino acid substitution in the beta chain of hemoglobin, which renders it insoluble in the deoxygenated state. So what happens, these RBCs, which have, which demonstrate these uh, mutations, they are very sticky. So they, uh, they what they undergo adhesions between various uh, other RBCs and other cells like neutrophils, platelets, endothelial cells and these form a clog and occlude the vessels causing basal occlusion. Now pathogenesis of beta thalassemia. Beta thalassemia it is characterized by complete absence or decreased synthesis of normal globin chains. So there is absence of beta globulin chains and there are only alpha globulin chains if it is beta thalassemia major, which is the most severe type. Then what happens is these RBCs, they are prone to premature destruction, also known as ineffective erythropoiesis and peripheral hemolysis leading to hypochromic microcytic anemia. Also, because there is anemia, there is extra medullary hematopoiesis in organs like liver and spleen. There is organomegaly of these organs. There is hypercoagulability, increased iron absorption with the resulting increase in iron overload. So how do you screen for these hemoglobinopathy? So according to the antenatal guidelines given by NICE, all the females all the pregnant females, they should be screened for hemoglobinopathy by 10 weeks. And the universal method of screening is family origin questionnaire in low prevalence areas, that is where the prevalence is less than 1.5 per 10,000 pregnancies. However, if the prevalence is high, that is more than 1.5 per 10,000 pregnancies, over family origin questionnaire reveals high risk or there is MCH which is less than 27 when you do HPLC. So this was about screening then once uh, you have you found um, based on the screening you find that the uh, patient is a carrier then you test for the male partner. You identify the address couples like in which both male and females are carrier and then you uh, counsel them to cover the risk of affected offspring. You offer them pre-implantation genetic diagnostics and selective embryo transfer, the methods and risks of prenatal diagnosis and options of termination of pregnancy in case it is affected should be clearly explained to the patients. So if uh, the screening is missed at this level and the newborn is born, born then neonatal screening of the address couple should be done using a newborn blood spot test also known as hail prick test and all maternal carrier address couples uh, results are linked to the appropriate neonatal screening results to enable accurate diagnosis of the baby so that we can manage the baby in the postpartum state. The preconception screening in sickle cell disease, it should include echocardiography to screen for pulmonary hypertension. It should be done within one year. These patients are at risk of hypertension. So to screen for that, BP and urine analysis should be done in preconception period. Renal function test to rule out any nephropathy should be done on annual basis. Liver function test, they should also should be done on annual basis to rule out that the liver function is normal. Retinal screening should be done preconceptionally to rule out any retinopathy. Cardiac MRI should be done to rule out iron overload in the preconception period and this screening should be done for red cell autoantibodies in the preconception period. The common manifestations of sickle cell disease in the pregnancy include painful crisis, avascular necrosis, stroke, pulmonary hypertension, retinal disease, leg ulcers, acute chest syndrome, renal dysfunction, cholelithiasis. So now what are the medications that have to be stopped in the preconception period? 
So in case of sickle cell disease, hydroxyurea it should be stopped at least three months before conception. And ACE inhibitors and ARBs which are given for hypertension should be stopped in the preconception period. For beta thalassemia, iron chelators like Deferazirox and Deferipron should be stopped at least three months prior to conception. And the only iron chelator which is safe during pregnancy is Desferoxamine. This phosphonates also should be stopped. And what are the medications that you have to give? One is high dose that is 5 mg folic acid in sickle cell disease which you have to give ideally 3 months before conception and it has to be continued throughout the pregnancy. And uh, in cases of sickle cell disease particularly you have to give 150 mg of aspirin at 12 weeks of gestation and uh, you should review the patients by six, uh, 36 weeks to stop it. Now, some of these patients with beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease, we have undergone splenectomy. So, these patients are at high risk of infection by encapsulated bacteria like Neisseria. So, you should give them penicillin prophylaxis and you should give them various vaccines like pneumococcal, hepatitis, eupilis, influenza B, influenza and swine flu vaccine, conjugated meningococcal C, meningitis B and ECWI and COVID vaccine. So all these vaccines has to be given. Now coming over to uh, low molecular weight heparin prophylaxis. For sickle cell disease, to all the women from 28 weeks of gestation, you should give uh, LMWH. And post delivery, if it's a normal delivery, you continue it for 10 days. And if it's a cesarean injection, you continue it for 6 weeks. Then for beta thalassemia, the prophylaxis depends on whether the patient has uncon splenectomy and whether she has thrombocytosis with platelet count more than 6 lakh. So if there is a history of splenectomy or platelet count more than 6 lakh alone, you give them only low dose aspirin. If she has both, that is both thrombocytosis and splenectomy, then you give them a combination of aspirin and LMWH. Now coming over to treatment. For sickle cell disease, you have to avoid the precipitating factors like uh, dehydration, exposure to extreme temperatures, overexertion. These patients have painful crisis. So NSAIDs, if you have to give, you have to give only between 12 to 28 weeks. In the recent guideline, uh, in the talk, it is written 31 weeks. In GTG, it is written as 28 weeks of gestation. Routinely, you generally give iron supplementations. However, in these cases, you will give iron supplementation only if there is iron deficiency, which is demonstrated by low ferritin level, less than 30 microgram per liter. Routine prophylactic blood transfusion is not currently recommended. Then what are the indications of blood transfusion in pregnancy in sickle cell disease? One, if the patient has previous serious medical, obstetric and fetal complications, then you can give them exchange or top of transfusion based on the indication. If the women was already on some transfusion reg regimen, then you continue it during the pregnancy. If it's a twin pregnancy, you can give them prophylactic transfusion. If it's acute anemia, you give them top-up transfusion. If it's acute chest syndrome or acute stroke, you give them exchange transfusion. Now coming over to the complications in pregnancy. So complications are related to sickling, that is anemia, requirement of blood transfusion, painful crisis, admission to ICU, acute chest syndrome, UTI or it could be pregnancy related or exacerbated like pregnancy induces, induced hypertensive disease, renal insufficiency, venous thromboembolism, antepartum hospital admission, postpartum infection. Fetal complications include miscarriage, preterm delivery, stillbirth, fetal growth restriction. How do you manage these complications? So if it's an acute chest syndrome which is characterized by respiratory symptoms like shortness of breath, tachypnea, chest pain and cough and on x-ray you will see some infiltrates. So these are managed primarily by antibiotics and oxygen. If there is a uh, hemoglobin is low that is less than 6.5 then you give them blood transfusion and severe hypoxia where hemoglobin levels are maintained then you can give them exchange transfusion. Then coming over to acute stroke management, it can be both ischemic and hemorrhagic. These are associated with acute neurological impairment and they require urgent brain imaging to diagnose and differentiate from the, uh, the type of the stroke. You should get an urgent exchange transfusion to reduce long-term neurological damage. Thromboenlysis should only be considered, should be considered in acute stroke secondary to sickle cell disease. So you can consider thrombolysis. 
then coming over to erythrovirus infection so it is the infection which is uh, which is triggered by a plastic uh, crisis investigations in, on investigations you will see there is acute anemia with red flow cytopenia owing to dead cell maturation arrest and these patients are treated with with blood transfusion isolation of women because this parvovirus is infectious and fetal medicine review then intrapartum and postpartum care so for sickle cell disease once the patient is in labor you have to do a continuous monitoring by ctg you have to aim for delivery between 38 to 40 weeks because after that the complications are more you routinely don't give blood transfusion and give it only if hemoglobin is less than 7 or hemoglobin level fall from the baseline is more than 2 Pethidine should ideally be avoided in patients with sickle cell disease because it precipitates seizures. So this is a diagram which is which demonstrate the antenatal visits in patients with sickle cell disease. So these are divided between midwife and MDT visits. So as you can see, early booking there should be a booking by with with midwife and my MDT team. Seven to uh, nine weeks you do an ultrasound. There is a visit for ultrasound. then there is a dating visit at 11 to uh, ultrasound for dating 11 to 14 weeks then 16 weeks there is a visit, visit by both midwife and mtt then 20 weeks there is an anomaly scan and mtt visit then then every 4 weeks there is a visit with by mtt after 20 weeks 24 28 2 weeks like 26 30 34 38 these are midwife free visits and after 38 weeks you plan for delivery now come